Okay, so I got a question to start off. Hopefully, we'll, we'll get the audience question in a second. So I'm, I'm still a little confused uh, in, in, in the sense about, should everybody, why not they just get Watchman device? Why not everybody? Can I take that? Yeah, by all means. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, any procedure has its own risks. So just from the, just conceptually, from the standpoint of safety, you're gonna have to pay a price a fair amount of patients. However percentage, however small the percentage is, there is a rate of complications with the Watchman. It's about 1% uh, risk of uh, hemo pericardium, so tearing uh, the appendix when you deploy it. And it's going to be very similar for other devices. Uh, the biggest drawback, the biggest problem that appendage occlusion devices have, the weakest uh, component of the whole thing is there is a small but present incidence of device-related thrombus. So you put the device in there and, and a small percentage of patients are going to develop a thrombus, which is very very much creating the very problem you're trying to prevent. And that is yet to be figured out. We don't, we don't know. From the data that, that uh, is available from the Watchman studies, the incidence is about 3.7%, which is not minor. And when you have it, with patients that have a clot in the device, the incidence of stroke is quadruple that of the, of the patients that don't have a clot there. So. Um, I think with the uh, occlusion devices, the, the dust is still settling. We know that uh, when everything goes fine and the watchman is deployed properly and then a few months is completely endothelialized, then you're good. But there, that doesn't happen in 100% of the patients. And, and it's a very expensive device. It's a very expensive pr procedure to do. Um, it, it only makes sense financially if the patient is going to live at least five years, because otherwise the cost of anticoagulants is a lot, a lot less. It only makes sense uh, in terms of outcomes from the patient if, if you're going to live long enough. What the devices do best is prevent iatrogenesis, prevent uh, anticoagulation-induced hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic strokes. That is the, big, the biggest value. So uh, in, my, in my opinion, uh, the 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 field of appendage occlusion is still not completely uh, finalized. The data is still being gathered, and we'll, we'll hear, we'll know, know more in the next five, 10 years. Any additional comments? No, I entirely agree with Dr. V. The, the thing, just to clarify on what Dr. V is saying, when you have an appendage, the clots inside the appendage. So even on, you know, patients on anticoagulation, still there's a certain percentage of them who have strokes, but those patients, when they develop a thrombus, it's on the inside of the appendage. But when, now that you've occluded uh, the appendage by placing a device in it, the clot forms on the outside of the device itself, which is really in the left atrium. Uh, so that's why the incidence of strokes in those patients, as Dr. Valderrano was implying, um, is significantly higher once that clot forms. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot of current trials going on looking at all this, and I think we're gonna know more as the years go by. Okay, we'll go, we have a few questions here. Go ahead. This is outside the window of anticoagulation. So it's after the implant of the device um, on patients who are, so the, once the device is implanted, like let's take, take the Watchman since it's, it's the only FDA approved device currently in the United States. Uh, once implanted, the first 45 days is the time frame that we uh, generally expect the device to become endothelialized and be completely covered. And once it's endothelialized, it's significantly safer. But in that first 45 days, uh, there's a risk of uh, thrombus forming on the outside of the device, which is not yet endothelialized. But there, there were also cases reported uh, in the largest series just a few weeks ago um, of device-related thrombus. Um, the, this, the spectrum of timing of the thrombus relative to the implant is quite broad. So yes, the highest risk is the first 45 days, but there were cases of thrombi developing later. And the manufacturer blames it on the fact that there's a little screw, what they call the threaded insert, at the center of the watchman that is metal and it's not always endothelialized. It's at the very center. Um, and that, those, that's the location where, where cl late clots were found. Okay. How often is ablation unsuccessful? Or do they reoccur? Do those AFIBs come back? Never. <laughs> <laughs> it's always... No. Um, <laughs> ablation, so 
we have to first define the, the patient population. Paroxysmal AFib, you can expect a single procedure success of about 75%. Now that sounds mediocre, but we define success in a very, very rigorous way. Success means that following uh, for one year the patient and monitoring the patient at the end of one year, they have less than 30 seconds of AFib in a 48 hour monitor. Now, less than 30 seconds, you may have 31 seconds of AFib and that will make you a failure. That counts as a, as a 25% uh, risk of failure. Um, most of the patients that fail usually becomes apparent right away. You do the ablation and, and you know, they may, have, uh, they may have rhythm control for a month, maybe six weeks, and then all of a sudden AFib comes back. Sometimes it comes up with a vengeance more symptomatic because they tend to have more flutters uh, and, and the atrial fibrillation in the, in the atria is slower, but the ventricular response tends to be uh, faster, so it's more symptomatic. So uh, for those patients, we simply have to repeat the procedure. Mm -hmm. The technical, uh, I define failures, there are two kinds. Technical failures in which the pulmonary veins reconnect and all you need to do is just do it again. Uh, and then mechanistic failures where you may have a beautifully isolated pulmonary vein in the patient and then the patient still has AFib. And some of those are strange cases where you may have AFib starting from the superior vena cava and you may need to isolate the superior vena cava. Some patients may have venal martial triggers and different areas that, that may put the patient in AFib aside from the pulmonary veins. And we don't have a good way to mechanistically tease out which patient is going to benefit from which approach. So. Um, the bottom line is, um, why is ablation so successful despite the lack of hard outcomes data? Because it solves a problem for the physicians and for the patients. Pati we, we keep getting patients referred for AFib. All you need to do is have one or two successful ablations and the referring physician is going to send you more patients because it takes care of the problem. And when it does, it's a very, very, I don't, I don't have patients that have been so grateful. Um, compared to the, any other disease. Uh, uh, the pulmonary vein isolation success, is, is a, it makes a life change for the patient. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we have a very important question. Why are so many patients kept on amiodarone with its known toxicity? Well, because, well I can, I can take this one. Yeah. But, um, it's a very good question, and I do believe that we have to change it we have to remove people from a mutarone. Now, there are exceptions to the rule that people cannot tolerate an ablation and there is uh, no way the patient to keep him out of the hospital and that's the only time that we can really use a mutarone as a salvage drug rather than the first liner therapy for our patients. Um, and a mutarone is a very toxic drug, as you probably know, a skin, lung, thyroid, um, liver disease, and you have to have continuous monitoring pulmonary fibrosis, so it's at the end is, is, is not a solution. I think we have to push our patients off amiodarone and convince our cardiologists to send the patient to electrophysiologists so we can try to consider a different alternative. Yeah. What do you think? How do you feel about the... <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about the, um, the older uh, patients who perhaps aren't uh, candidates for procedures and who end up re re recurrently in the hospital with tachycardia and, and, and since their longevity and their time frame on amiodarone therapy is gonna be less. Um, yeah, so um, if their atrial fibrillation puts them on the hospital, like some of them they do, some of them they don't, I think it's a reasonable to consider Amiodarone, but there are other drugs, Ticosin, which is a newer drug that has been working really great for us too and doesn't have the amount of side effects. Too. Yeah, the problem with amiodarone is that I, I think it makes it easy for the, for the physician. You take the drug, it's, it's the most powerful antiarrhythmic drug we have. Um, and unlike Sotol or Olofetolide, that you have to monitor the QT interval because if it prolongs, you can kill the patient. And that's a, obviously an immediate stress from the physician. <laughs> I mean, other on, sure, you may die of lung, of lung toxicity, but it's going to take a few months. It will be someone else's problem. <laughs> to be crude. But um, it is like that. Um, 
I <laughs> use a lot of amiodarone and I use it long, uh, short term. I use it short term post ablation. Some patients that may have AFib for a long time, you have persistent AFib and you need to do an aggressive ablation, and you know the AFib is going to fight back. Um, I keep them on amiodarone for one, two months, three months. But long term amiodarone, I tell you, if we have, to, if I have to use it for, for for an elderly patient or a debilitated patient, I just do an AV node ablation and put a pacemaker in those patients and the symptoms are taken care of. <laughs> I do think there's very, the only true indication for amiodarone long term is ventricular tachycardia in the presence of structural heart disease because that's where it, it can make a big difference. Huh? Dr. Zago? Is there a role nowadays with all these uh, uh, patient monitoring devices where you feel comfortable that if you have a compulsive patient, could be a physician or whatever it is, that is using an, a live core monitor that they can check in the morning in addition to what they do in the morning, they can check their rhythm. I'm just thinking out loud futuristically. We have quite a few ways of monitoring things nowadays. Is there a place for, uh, for individuals to stop anticoagulation if they can monitor even their heart rate every day? It's a fascinating question, and I think the, the, the assumption uh, under that question is that you're only at risk of stroke when you're in AFib, and that when AFib stops, you're fine. And there was a study um, published in 2015 where they looked at patients with atrial fibrillation detected on pacemaker recordings, right? asymptomatic, and they saw that uh, patients that had asymptomatic episodes uh, detected by the pacemaker, anywhere uh, longer than six minutes, those were associated with an increased risk of stroke. But then they look at the temporal connection between those episodes and, and embolic events, and there was no relationship, which is fascinating. What that illustrates is that AFib may be considered not just of uh, risk factor for stroke because of the mechanism of, of stasis in the appendage and clots in the appendage, but it may be also a risk marker of vascular disease. And it may just the presence of AFib may be associated with risk of stroke, but not necessarily due to AFib. So if you take anticoagulation only when you have AFib, but you also have vascular disease that puts you at risk for local thrombosis in, in, the, in the cerebral vasculature, it's not gonna work. Right. There is a study going on, I think, funded by Medtronic, looking at this, at the reveal, uh, at the um, implantable monitor, an implantable monitor and, and rhythm-directed therapy. So we'll know more. But I'm a bit skeptical about, about the, the approach. Well, you guys are in high demand. I've got maybe a minute left for maybe two quick answers. Uh, what about aspirin post-watchmen in patients who had a GI bleed with aspirin? So generally speaking, uh, the, you know, the, the, the atrial fibrillation anticoagulation regimen, to be honest with you, was initiated by the first investigator, and he tells the story often himself, and it's quite humorous. He was literally sitting in his office one afternoon all by himself, and he came up with this regimen, and that was the regimen that was used in the first clinical trial, and it kind of stuck, which is why currently there are several ongoing uh, trials trying to relook at the subject matter and come up with a better assessment of what we really need. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, on a watchman, we uh, recommend aspirin and, and anticoagulation for 45 days and then Plavix and aspirin for six months and then 81 milligrams of aspirin subsequently. However, in patients such as that, uh, we have uh, tailored uh, a variety of what we consider off-label uh, regimens that uh, seem to do fairly well. As Dr. Valdebano indicated earlier, there is um, some risk of uh, clot formation, especially if you deviate from that uh, anticoagulation regimen. Uh, but we have tailored uh, several different varieties to those patients who have those kind of complications. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. The rest will be EP consultation. <laughs>